Yeah, I can't hear anybody talking. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, now I hear somebody.
Cheers and welcome to the Science of Beer Homebrew Edition presented by Wells Fargo. We are thrilled to bits to have you all here with, with us tonight virtually. Please remember, enjoy this evening responsibly. This evening is designed for adults 21 plus. By being here, you really are becoming a partner in the museum's mission, connecting people to inspiring science. We've raised the bar on virtual fundraising, and tonight, 100% of your support will go to the Mods COVID Recovery Fund. We'd like to thank and toast all of our sponsors, our presenting sponsor, Wells Fargo, our snack pack sponsor, Truist, and the other many sponsors this evening, including all of you at home. So what can you expect? Beer is a science. It's a science in a glass, and I'm a fan of both of them. We've brewed up an incredible evening. You're gonna be going on a tour of Funky Buddha Brewery right here in Oakland Park, and you're gonna be making a beer can robot. And then a little bit later, trivia on tap with prizes. We also have an incredible silent auction. And thank you to all of our silent auction sponsors. That's taking place until nine o'clock tonight. So please visit the website that's probably down there somewhere and check out the vast array of items that we've got for you to win. In tonight's event kit, sponsored by Truist, you're going to find an array of great beer from Funky Buddha and Bonehook Brewery. There's some peanut brittle, some chocolate-covered Oreos from BBX and Hoffman's Chocolates, and some snacks. You're also going to find everything that you need to make a beer can robot at home. Now, let's pop over to Funky Buddha Brewery and tap into the pint-sized science that goes into making beer. So tonight we're at Funky Buddha Brewery right here in Oakland Park. But for those of you on the West Coast, or if you're visiting Naples, make sure that you go visit Bonehook Brewery. They're gonna be joining us later for the trivia section. Funky Buddha Brewery in Oakland Park and thrilled to bits to be here with Ryan and Casey and we're going to do an amazing tour. Looking forward to it. Amazing. That's amazing. No, no pressure. I mean, <laughs> it's going to be an amazing tour. It's going to be the best tour you've ever been on at Funky Buddha. I will be the best tour. <laughs> And it smells fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we're brewing. It's, yeah, it's one of our favorite parts of coming in, smelling the, the beer. We, we start by milling in the grain, which is basically just opening up, cracking the grain, and allowing the sugars to be released from the grain. Uh, we have a 55,000 pound tank that holds our grain um, from at the outside. And we also have different types, whether it's uh, wheat or, bar or dark, you know, dark malts, roasted, marley, roasted barley, or uh, different crystal malts, depending on what, what kind of beer we're making. Uh, today's beer is mostly uh, Pilsner malt, and we'll also use flaked oats to give it more of a body, and a lot of lactose, which is a milk sugar. And that's our way of kind of creating that kind of creaminess that you would have in, in this particular drink. Uh, next part of the process. So the grains are milled, came and dropped over here and mixed with water. So that process, we are basically extracting the sugars from that grain and creating what we call wort, which is uh, basically just a, a sweet liquid. Um, after we're done and, you, and, and, and you're extracted all the, the sugars from that grain and you're left with that sweet water, the water only is transferred to the next tank, which is our, our boil kettle. The grains are left behind and they are d dumped out from the bottom, sent out outside. And probably once or twice a week, we have uh, uh, farmers from uh, like cows that'll come pick up a truck, 
take the grains and they feed it to the cows. Right, so local local farmers? Yes, yep, yep, they come in and pick it up and you know, we it's benefit for us, we're able to get rid of the grains and benefit for them, they, they you know, feed for the cows. So from here, we've already taken that sweet water and we've transferred over into our boil kettle. And the, the purpose of the boil kettle is to, to boil it. So we're bringing up to pasteurization temperatures, anything that might be in there that might cause infection or bacteria in the beer, that's killed. But this is also our opportunity to add hops, which is basically the balance that you'll have in beer. So you already have a, a sweet water, now you need some balance. Depending on the beer, uh, is dependent on how, how much hops you use and when you add it. So sometimes you're gonna add hops the very beginning of the process and all you're getting from that is bitterness. Uh, maybe you'll do that for an IPA or something that's yeah, really that's sweet. Kind of yeah. So you're like IPAs. So an IPA, you would do it not only at the beginning, but you do it in the middle because maybe that's gonna give you more flavor. And then you do it at the very end, which is just gonna be for aroma. Yep. So uh, that all happens here. Um, so we want to now bring it into a tank and add yeast to it. But what would happen, I mean, you're a science guy, if, if we put in yeast in 212 degree water, <laughs> you kill the yeast, absolutely. Yeah. So we run it through a heat exchanger, uh, which takes it from 212 degrees to whatever temperature we're, we want based on the speed and, and the cold water that we're flowing through. Uh, generally, we're fermenting our beers at about uh, 20 degrees uh, Celsius, so about 20, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so we run it through the heat exchanger into the fermenter and then we, we pitch the yeast and that's when uh, it does its job. We'll take you over to, to okay. one of the tanks for many. So now adding the yeast, what it does is it wants to eat that sugar. And the byproduct of that is it creates alcohol, which is what we're there after, and also CO2. So in your case, in the case of your dad, he probably didn't, he probably had it uh, plugged up, didn't have enough, and, and will it explode. I mean, I, I've had it hit the ceiling before. So we're seeing that right now. If you look into this bucket here, yep. And you're seeing we're actually we're actually releasing all the CO2. So this is a natural action of the of the of the yeast. The sugar is being consumed by the yeast. So if we didn't do this, you know, we closed this off. Now we're capturing all that CO2 in yeah, the tank. The so the pressure builds up and we can have a you know a giant explosion. Well, you get that smell immediately. Oh yeah, for sure. As soon as yeah. you close that, yeah. you could smell that. I mean, depending on what we're brewing, him and I are very susceptible to certain yeast. We can know what we brewed by walking in the building 200 yards away and, and say, okay, this Floridian's being brewed. Because yeah. it puts off a very, to be very beginning a very sulfuric smell, so. All right, so at this point, the process is done. The beer, the beer is fermented. Uh, we've, we've crashed it, which means, you know, we talked about we, we, we fermented it at 70 degrees. Now we've lowered it down to 35 degrees. With the process, the, the hopes that all the yeast that's up in suspension falls down to the bottom and we're creating a brighter, cleaner beer. Um, it's still gonna have some suspension, some stuff in there. We might have some hops. So we'll, we, our way of filtering it is using a centrifuge. So oh, basically, a centrifuge, a centrifuge yep. Yep, so, uh, you know, similar to like with people that don't know about this, like if they remember the old ride Gravitron that just spun you around in a circle and you're stuck to the wall. So this is the same thing. So, but what, what happens is it's sending in the beer in such a rapid rate that the yeast ends up sticking to the wall and collecting and discharging every once in a while. Okay. So the result, it'll go in cloudy and come out as clean as we want it based on how fast or slow we run the centrifuge. So goes to there and on its way to what we call the bright tank. Uh, we're actually carbonating a beer right now, as you can you can hear it. Once it's in here, uh, we will. There's a, a carbonation stone that we we add our CO2, and it slowly bubbles the CO2 in the tank to bring it up whatever carbonation level we want. So that's the CO2 is the carbonation. Yes, yes, yep, sorry, carbonation. Um, and based on the style of beer, you might want something that's really heavily carbonated to where if you want a porter or a stout, you maybe want something a little more smooth. So we will do that, come back, measure it, test it, and see where it's at. Once that happens, the beer is conditioned, carbonated, ready to go, and then it's packaged, either kegged or bottled here. And you know, it's like when you look at something like this, this is what's always so amazing to me about breweries, not just that they make beer, which who doesn't love beer, yeah. but it's the science that goes into it. Yeah. It really is. And it's the career opportunities. Sure. You know, at the museum, we talk about, you know, a science museum can be careers from, you know, cradle all the way up to career. Yeah. We want kids to get excited about the opportunities. Yeah. When people think of science, you know, they might think of lab coats. They may not think of the engineer who's developing 
new right. canning techniques. Right, right. And that is something which is very much needed. Every one of my employees that works on this equipment knows more about than me about that piece of equipment. And they work on it day in and day out. So there's still so much for me to learn. And, you know, that's, that's the great part about the industry. Well, and so much is still changing. I mean, we were talking earlier about, you know, the evolution of seltzers and how that's, you know, a new opportunity. But, you know, people's flavor profiles change. Yeah. People, as you grow up, you hopefully like more sophisticated yeah, beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, it's fascinating to see this. Yeah. <laughs> so we've, we, just, we just crossed over 3,000. So we've done 3,000 barrels in, uh, since, since we've opened. You'll see it in a couple of the barrels, there's nails in them. Yeah. So we'll take, you know, we'll sterilize a nail, put it in there, and that's how we uh, pull it out and liquid will come out and we'll use that for sensory. We'll also use it to take it back to the lab and test it, make sure there's no so if you microbes. Nail and take it out, mm -hmm. just plug it up afterwards. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, got, you got a stream. Uh, there's a couple of good videos out there of Casey getting a stream to the face, but so this is one of the things that we, we kind of pride ourselves on. Um, being a, being a craft brewery and still, we're still small in the standard of the, the beer world, uh, we take this part very seriously. Uh, it's, it's for repeatability, for making sure that the product that we send out is gonna be as good as it is in three months that, we, that it was on day one. Uh, so that's where this comes in. A lot of testing, uh, we probably test the beer 25 different times throughout the process. Um, again, make, making sure, not looking for microbes or wild yeast, um, but then also just making sure that it's the ABV that we said it is. We test for carbonation. So um, right here, uh, it's kind of cool. This is not a setup. This is a little seltzer test that we're doing. Oh. So th these are just um, different, different seltzer bases that we're trying with different yeast nutrients. So we wanted to see if the yeast nutrients would actually help it uh, ferment a little faster or if it would make it cleaner and, and, or bump up the alcohol. So we'll do this and, and the, the, the girls in the lab will, will run tests. And you know, again, this is not something we could have done five years ago. So this is a huge part of, of our growth. And I'd say if anything continues to grow and, and with, with Funky Buddha, it's our, what we keep putting back into quality and uh, testing purposes. And up next, Trivia on Tap. This is an opportunity for you to answer questions about beer and win prizes. Are we prizes. doing trivia right now? All right, well, thanks to our friends at Funky Buddha for the tour. Product's delicious. Now we'd like to go to Bill Vaughn at Bonehook Brewery in Naples. Hi, cheers, everyone. Uh, so we're over in, uh, in Naples on the, on the Western coast. Uh, we have a, about 7,000, uh, 9,000 co uh, annual capacity brewery. Um, so we're not quite the size of funky Buddha yet. Uh, but you know, we got nothing but the future ahead of us. And, uh, so one of the things that differs slightly in, in their process and ours is I'm the only person currently in the brewery and in, in operation. So, uh, it depends on what's needed of me for the day. Uh, some days I go in and brew. I'm brewing about two to three days a week right now. As uh, we get busier, it'll be probably th uh, four to five days a week. And at that point, I'll probably be bringing someone in for our packaging. Uh, that's kegging and canning <clears throat> and uh, some of the cellar work. We call the, the work that you, when you transfer beer from a, a fermentation tank to a bright tank or a conditioning tank, uh, cellar work. Uh, and so we'll be probably bringing someone in at that point to, to assist me with that. Um, but for me, it just depends on what, what, what needs to be done for the day. Uh, again, some days I come in and I just work on getting orders ready for distrib uh, distribution partners or uh, brewing. And it's the same process as Funky Buddha in terms of what we're doing. We all do the same thing. We all make wort. Uh, we all add yeast to the wort and allow it to ferment. Uh, we transfer it to a tank and let it carbonate uh, and condition. And then we package it, whether it's in cans or uh, cases or, or uh, kegs or uh, bottles, whatever. But um, it's, it's all the same process. Uh, for us, it's just a slightly smaller scale. Um, and uh, we, uh, we currently have our distribution set up uh, through um, Crafty Connoisseurs over on the West Coast. Um, so if you uh, seek out any of our beers, uh, tonight I'm drinking the Hef. Um, that is our Hefeweizen. And uh, we have that in cans. We also have 
a light lager called the Grateful Head on in uh, in cans. Uh, Wicked Seas is our New England style IPA, hazy and citrusy, um, as well as uh, the uh, Liquid Laugh is our Belgian triple. Um, that one's been really gaining a lot of momentum and uh, just can't seem to brew enough of it. So uh, that's a nine and a half percent Belgian triple, uh, nice and fruity from the yeast. Uh, and uh, and it's a little on the potent side, so you know, be careful with that one. Um, but yeah, it's the same process essentially. Um, you know, smaller setup, and uh, we look forward to having you guys over on on the West Coast sometime. Stop in. Uh, we're on a Mockley Road, fifteen fourteen Mockley Road in Naples, Florida, and uh, I'm going to send it back to you, Mods. All right, thank you. So welcome to Trivia on Tap, sponsored by PNC Bank and Bank of America with our friends at Funky Buddha and Bonehook Breweries. So as we ask questions, please respond in the chat, ask me if you have an answer. The first respondent will be unmuted to answer the question, and if it's incorrect, we'll move on to the next respondent. Uh, winners will receive a guest, uh, gift certificate to a local restaurant, and once again, as we ask the questions, if you have the answer, just type ask me in the chat and we'll unmute you and see what you got. Okay, are we ready to go? All right, so let's get started. First question, fairly simple one. What are the four main ingredients in a typical beer? All right, we have our answer. Uh, barley, yeast, hops, and water. Barley, yeast, hops, and water. Correct. Very good. All right. So when you do get a question right, uh, you will be getting a gift certificate to a local restaurant. Just, we'll go ahead and, and go over some rules about how we're gonna claim those prizes in a little bit. Next question. What is the amber liquid extracted from malted barley? Once again, what is the amber liquid extracted from malted barley? Anybody, who we got? Okay. Hello? Yes. Go ahead, Laura. Wart. 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 Correct. Wart. <laughs> Wart is the liquid extracted from the masking process during the brewing of beer or whiskey. Contains sugars that will be fermented uh, as that yeast produces the actual alcohol. All right. Next question. This might be a little tougher. What are some small invertebrates? commonly found in gardens or forests that actually enjoy beer. Small invertebrates, commonly found in a forest or a garden that enjoy beer. We have a response? I'll, I'll go right. for worms. We got? I'll go for worms. Go ahead. What was that? Worms. Worms, worms is incorrect. Next response. Uh, and who's next? Zachary, anybody? Okay, I see the correct answer in the chat. Patricia. Um, yes. Patricia? Snails? Jack got a little crazy here. <laughs> Snails? Slugs. Slugs? Snails? Slugs. Yes. Slugs. Okay. I heard someone say slugs. Patricia said slugs. That is correct. Slugs actually enjoy beer, right? Don't enjoy salt. So maybe stick away from some salt if you see a slug, depending on how much you like it or dislike it. Some beer or salt is going to take it either way. All right. Next question. What four U.S. presidents, so there's four answers to this one, what four U.S. presidents were noted home brewers?
Anybody got a guess on this one? Somebody take a little time. Seeing some answers in the chat that are partially correct. Phi? Is that the name? Sorry. <laughs> Far from the screen here. Washington, Thomas, Madison, and Monroe. Uh, not all the way right. No, I'm sorry. Any other guesses on this one? Okay, tell you what, this is kind of a tough one. Let's simplify it a little bit. Out of those presidents, who is the only one to actually brew beer in the White House during their term? All right, looks like Dan has an answer. It was Obama. Obama is correct. Thank you. Even though uh, Washington may have brewed beer while he was president, did not technically live in the White House yet. So that one was a little tricky. Coming back a little focus, what percentage is the world's strongest beer? So what percentage alcohol, alcohol by volume is the wor world's strongest beer? Question, any vocal answers here? Ask me, Dan, says that. Brad, who's got an answer? A wild guess, 30? 30 is not correct. Okay. <laughs> Michael. Sixty-seven point five. Sixty-seven point five is correct. That's a little tough. I would take that one sip at a time. Uh, that is a beer okay. made by a British company that is rightfully named it Snake Venom because it sounds like too much of it could harm you. <laughs> All right, next question. What is the technical name for brewer's yeast? Technical name for brewer's yeast. Okay, if you, <laughs> we're encouraging people to not go to Wikipedia. Uh, Cervasi, but somebody just wrote it in the chat in the chat. What was that? It is the Cervasi, Cervasi, but then somebody also wrote it in the in the chat. Okay. Uh, we'll refer to the but judges the on the points thing. on that one. Uh, <laughs> if any of the brewers want to chime in and uh, maybe give some insight on uh, brewers yeast for a minute, feel free to chime in. The uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, it, uh, that was for the most part right. Uh, Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae is uh, typically an ale. Uh, there's uh, Saccharomyces uh, pastorianus is lager. So there are some uh, variations, but at the end of the day, most brewers and wine yeast are sac. We call it sac or Saccharomyces. That makes sense because that's a really hard word to say. So we're <laughs> going to abbreviate as much as we can. All right, next question. This one might be a little bit easier. What does IPA stand for? All right, looks like David was the first in. Hi, I would say that's an Indian pale ale. India pale ale is correct. Uh, do any of our brewer friends want to give us any insight on where that came from? India so that, pale ale. So that's uh, you know they, they say the uh, it came from when uh, the English would send the, the beer a beer to India when they occupied India, they would send it on ships and they would throw extra hops in there, make it a little higher alcohol to help preserve it because you would have to uh, take it down under Africa and then back up. So it was uh, you know a five six seven month trip 
Um, so they needed to preserve it the best they could. Hops are natural preservative, alcohol as well. So they would uh, over hop it. And it was uh, beer for India, beer for export to India. And then it just became known as India Pale Ale. Interesting. And then uh, definitely blew up in popularity over here in recent years. Uh, so next question, I'm going to go and do a little bit more of the optimism here of what we're talking about, we're talking about health and wellness. Beer contains which major vitamins? So what are some essential vitamins that can be found in beer? Who is, is Dan? Dan saying, ask me. Uh, alcohol does <laughs> yeah, not count got, as a vitamin, no acid, but good guess. Some vitamin uh, D and C, yeah. Sorry, what was that? You got amino acids in there, and you got some vitamin uh, D and uh, C. Uh, vitamin B, Vitamins sorry. D and C, as well as some amino acids. Yes, mostly vitamins B1, 2, 6, and 7. Uh, so some mixtures of B vitamins in there. And again, I would imagine maybe one of our brewer friends could give some insight on maybe some different styles of beer or different additives to beer might add or take out certain vitamins. Any brewers give us some insight on the nutritional value of beer? So uh, as, as far as I know, I don't think anything really removes the vitamin from beer um, other than maybe filtering. Uh, that one's a little tricky um, because the vitamin B mostly comes from the yeast. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if there's anything that helps accentuate it or, or remove it uh, really, but um, the guys at Funky Buddha might know. I'm not sure if, they, if, they're, not, if they're having a hard time chiming in or not, but uh, maybe mm -hmm. they can get some feedback if they're able to get in. Well, beer has protein in it um, a little bit, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about the uh, um, uh, vitamin B or uh, yeah, vitamin B. I heard there was vitamin B in it, but um, yeah, there's definitely vitamin. Like I said, it's co mostly comes from the yeast, uh, you know, but yeah, I'm not sure if there's any way to accentuate it or to, uh, to remove it. Yeah, that's a tough one to tell. Uh, typically, uh, when I take B vitamins just on their own, I tend to gain energy. It's not usually the case uh, with a lot of beer. So, well, there's also, uh, the, you know, they have uh, brewer's yeast in the vitamin uh, section you can get. Um, you right. can actually take brewer's yeast pills, you know, capsules. Okay, yeah, uh, well, one day if I'm ever low on that, that's good to know. <laughs> uh, so, back to our questions. This is more in the common knowledge and retail category. How many gallons of beer make up a keg? Full keg. How many gallons of beer make up a keg? Uh, is this? 11.2 gallons. 11.2 gallons, uh, that is not the answer I have. Anybody else have a good one? Laura? Many? I did. Which How many? 27. How many 27? gallons of beer make up a keg? 27. Uh, 27 is is not correct. Dang it. Anybody else? Andrew? A lot of time in college. 15 and a half kegs. 15 and a half 15 gallons. 15 and a half right. gallons. Correct. 15 and a half kegs would be quite a bit for your average dorm party. Uh, 15 and a half gallons is a keg, uh, equivalent to half a barrel. For those uh, putting 30 in the chat, a full barrel is 30 gallons, 31, 31. gallons, something in there. A keg would be 15.5 gallons. I welcome any of our brewer friends who might deal with that on a daily basis to correct me or uh, clarify any of that. Yeah, that's accurate. Um, 
uh, half barrel, the, the thing that most people are used to is a full keg. That's what we refer to as a half barrel keg, 15.5 gallons. We measure most uh, most everything in barrels. Uh, so my brew house is a 15 barrel brew house. Uh, it's capable of producing 440 gallons of beer uh, per turn. I have 30 barrel fermenters, uh, you know, so they're 980 gallons, you know, so we base everything off of that. So if, uh, there are also quarter quarter keg, quarter, bar uh, quarter barrel kegs, uh, 7.75 gallons and one six barrel kegs are 5.167 gallons. So uh, a lot of different uh, options there, but 15 and a half is your uh, full keg. And uh, what would be those, those quarter barrel kegs? Is that would that be what I would call a pony keg? Yeah, a lot of, traditionally a lot of uh, a lot of us older gentlemen <laughs> would refer to uh, to that as a pony. Um, but it's a quarter keg or a six barrel. Often get that get that uh, that you know that moniker the the pony keg. Uh, so yeah, quarter barrel being a quarter of uh, thirty one gallons, seven point seven five gallons. Great. Okay, we have. Uh reach our last official question, but after this, we're going to be having some Q&A uh, with the brewers. So last question, which country has the most individual beer brands? Which country has the most brands of beer to choose from? Is this Sh Shane or Laura? Yes, Laura was first with the ask. USA. Uh, incorrect. Oh, boy. Germany. <laughs> Told you it was Germany. Can I guess again? Uh, no, we're going to have to move on to the next guess. Uh, who is next here? Nicholas? It's like Nicholas had the next ask me. Hey, how about Germany? Germany is also incorrect. Uh, who's next here? Shane. I'm gonna guess Ireland. Ireland is also incorrect. Traveling the world tonight. Uh, who's next? Shane looks like Steven. Or Patricia, I'll defer to the judges on who's next. Seeing a lot of action in the chat. Steven? Steven's next. No, I was going with Germany, so I'm out. Ah, okay. Looks like... Patricia? Czech Republic. Czech Republic, good guess. Not quite. Still looking for that right answer. Anybody can't see who's next? Hard to see the chat. Angie. There you go. Uh, Belgium. Belgium, correct. All right. We got that. I know there's a lot, a lot of little ones to remember there. I know, uh, you know, we think of that part of the world, Germany, Belgium, Czech Republic, when we think of those old styles of beers that have been around for hundreds of years. Uh, Belgium has... Uh, Apparently accumulated that many more brands. All right, lightning round. So we have one bonus question here that's going to be an interactive one. We're gonna go on a house scavenger hunt. We want you to find a beer can from one of our partner breweries that did not come in your package. So let's see if you can find one. So go up, see if you have a product from one of these breweries in your fridge or even outside of your fridge, maybe in your storage or maybe under your bed and see if, uh, and bring it up, show us on the, on the camera. Coors Light does not count, I'm sorry. We're looking exclusively for Funky Buddha or Bone Hook products. Do you have a Funky Buddha or Bone Hook product already in your house that did not come from our kit? Seen a lot of that's a rogue, uh, opposite side of the country. 
Uh, but good guess. Okay, David, looks like David's got one. Anybody else got a funky booter or bone hook beer in your fridge somewhere? I know I've got one, but it came in my kit, so this doesn't count. Who's this, Nick? Nick, you're the winner. Thank you for supporting our partners. So once we've settled back in from our scavenger hunt, gone to see maybe you forgot you had a funky Buddha or bone hook beer somewhere in your, in your house. Uh, once you settle back down, uh, we're gonna get into our post trivia part of this where we're just going to ask some questions to our brewers. So if you have any questions for our, uh, about beer or brewing uh, or anything about their businesses, uh, now's the time to put them in the chat, uh, and we'll try to get some interaction. Uh, this is your chance to really get inside the brain of a brewer. All right. This one, we'll start with, uh, start with our friends at Bonehook. What was the first beer your brewery ever made? Ooh, that's uh, that's a tough one because I wasn't there when the brewery opened, uh -huh. <laughs> so I, I can't I, I can't tell you for sure what what the first beer Bonehook brewed. Um, the first beer I brewed at Bonehook I started last July, uh, and the first beer I brewed there uh, I believe it was the um, at the time uh, that we had at the time that that I started. I believe it was the uh, the uh, Dirty Dave's IPA. No, no, I'm sorry. No, I know what it was. It was the Round and Brown. Round and Brown, Brown, I brewed there. Round and Brown. Uh, how about our friends at Funky Buddha? What was your first beer brewed? Uh, the first beer I brewed at Funky Buddha was uh, Floridian, as all uh, brewers will brew that first, and then hop gun, and then uh, we'll start getting into the more complex uh, beers uh, once they are proven that they can brew uh, our core beers on our system. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, Funky Buddha having some more humble beginnings at a, a little spot up in Boca a long time ago. Uh, so I know it's probably come a long way from there. Uh, getting some other good questions in the chat. Uh, I guess we'll go back to go back to our friends at Bonehook. What is your favorite Pilsner? Oh, or maybe I even mean, the style of Pilsner. It's uh, well, Pilsner is the style, but uh, um, it, it's hard to it's hard to beat Pilsner or Kell. It's the you know the original Pilsner. Uh, you know they've been brewing it for you know a couple hundred years now, so uh, you know it's really hard to beat that that beer. Um, but I also enjoy. Uh, you know, some of the more modern Pilsners that are a little on the hoppier side, too. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I've had some that are uh, uh, more on the, the dry hopped Pilsners, too, that I've really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. uh, Zachary? Uh, my favorite Pilsner? Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, I love Pilsner beer. Uh, they're crisp. Uh, they're clean. Um, I, I actually just brewed a Pilsner that's uh, on tap at Funky Buddha right now. Uh, it's called Check It Out Pils. It's, uh, it's a Czech-style Pils beer. Um, has a moderate uh, bitterness to it and a very uh, crisp, clean finish. Uh, it, it's difficult to say my favorite because I love the style so much, and um, there's a lot of breweries that really, especially in uh, Germany and the, in the Czech Republic, that can really pull off that style. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we'll go back and forth here. Let's go back to our friends at Bonehook. Let's say, let's preface this one with not counting one of your own beers. If you can have only one beer for the rest of your life, what beer would that be? <laughs> uh, me? Uh, uh, yeah, we can well, with you. Okay. Um, I love Kostritzer's Dark uh, Lager. It is probably my favorite beer of all time. Uh, after that, I would say uh, Weinstefaner, 
um, uh, Dunkel White Spear. Here we go. Uh, how about you over there? Yeah, 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 yeah. Dunkel, uh, the Vine Stuff Honor Dunkel Weiss is uh, mm. definitely at the top of the list. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to really say something that most people may not expect me to say, but I'm a huge fan of Yingling. Uh, I just I love Amber Lager. Uh, I can drink I can drink that beer uh, a lot more of that beer than I, I should probably admit uh, on camera. So um yeah, I, I, I should have bought stock if it were available. Well, obviously, it wasn't, I would like to buy stock because uh, I, I, could, I could help them out with it. <laughs> yeah, I'll admit that was one that was flowing in bulk uh, down in South Florida, you know, uh, in my younger, more vulnerable years as well. Uh, all right, next question. We can keep it on you. How did you get into brewing? Oh, beer. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I've, always, I've always enjoyed cooler flavored beers even you know when I was younger uh, I didn't really care for domestics I care I, you know I tried uh, you know Pilsners and I tried things like that and and when I when I discovered craft beer I absolutely fell in love and then I found out I could brew it for a fraction of the cost that it cost uh, to buy it so a friend of mine and I started doing that and uh, it's just been I, I knew from that moment on I needed to figure out how to get into this industry um, and uh, it took me a while to realign my my uh, career goals, but I finally got it. Uh, I got into the industry, and I, I, I absolutely love it. Excellent. Uh, Zachary, how about you? Uh, well, my father and my uncle have been home brewers for as back long as I can remember, and um, I was never really into it when I was uh, in college, and I moved out to uh, San Francisco, California for about a year and a half. And a friend of mine asked me to do the brewery tour at uh, Anchor Brewing Company. And I was just fascinated with this tour. And when, um, and when I moved back to the Chicagoland area where my parents live, um, I asked my dad if we could brew a beer together. And uh, he was like, yeah, sure. He's like, I was thinking about brewing a, a Bach this weekend. Uh, so I, I brewed a Bach and uh, with my dad it was his recipe and i had a good time i i bonded with my father and um and uh you know the very next week i was like well i want to do an ipa so we went and got the uh, ingredients and made an ipa and uh then we were making it about once a month that we were home brewing and um uh, funky buddha is actually the first brewery that i have ever worked and uh yeah i was uh, switching uh, careers and I, uh, I kept applying for the job, and uh, uh, they hired me, and I've been there for uh, four years now, so, and I wouldn't want anything else in the world. Excellent. Uh, on the topic of IPAs, uh, we have another question in the chat saying, why do IPAs seem to be the most common beers found in a craft brewery? Uh, is it is something about uh, being easier or more efficient to brew? Is there some other, uh, what kind of an insight could you maybe uh, give us on the popularity of that particular style of beer? Well, I, I know from experience that, um, you know, IPAs uh, just, I think it, it was, it was really uh, a lot of, a, a lot of the old timers, we, we would say we thought it was a fad, but um you know, what, what happens is, is a person tries that beer and as they're getting into craft beer or getting into more, you know, elo eloquent beers, they try that beer and it's got so much flavor and it, it kind of takes over your passion for, you know, for, for beer and you just can't get enough of it. So any brewery I've ever uh, been a part of, whether it was brewing their own, I own a, a brewery for a brief, for a brief time, uh, any uh, brewed at any brewery, it's just the number one selling uh, usually not usually the number one selling beer or, or one of the, one of the top five. Um, and we, I mean, I can brew five IPAs. I can have five IPAs on tap and they'll, they'll fill up, you know, five of the top 10 spots at the brewery. It's just, I think it's just the flavor that kind of really, uh, but you know, I think a lot of people burn out on them too. Uh, if you ask a lot of us old time brewers, you know, or, or, or people who have been into beer for 20, 25 years, uh, you know, most of us end up migrating out of the IPA thing. We still, we all still appreciate it, but we'll all, uh, well, mo most people I know that have been into it that long end up going back to the lighter stuff. You know, I want, 
something light and easy to drink, a light lager, um, because you can't drink, you know, a lot of IPAs and be functional. So the next day you're, you're going to be regretting it. So, uh, you know, but yeah, I think that's the popularity is just because it's, it's such a full flavored product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely a big flavor and still kind of tastes like a beer too. So it's a good uh, kind of gateway into other styles of beer than your uh, 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 more common. Uh, so next question here, this is an interesting one. Uh, is it possible to make bread with the brewer's yeast? Either one of you uh, ha has an answer. It is, but it would take uh, a lot longer um the brewer's yeast is, is designed to be or i'm sorry bread yeast is designed to be more efficient uh even though it's a very similar yeast strain um it's it's uh it's engineered essentially i mean all all, all yeast is essentially engineered in, in some fashion nowadays uh but it's, it's essentially engineered to be a quicker uh reaction time uh most brewer's yeast has a, a lag time that would um that would cause the bread uh, some difficulty. Uh, it, could, it could start to mold. Uh, so with bread, you want quick reaction time. Um, so you can, yes, you, you can, but it, it's, it's tricky. And I think you'd have to be a little more advanced uh, uh, in, your, in your fermentation science on that, degree, on that, that side. Fair enough. Uh, here's one I think would be good for our friends at Funky Buddha. Uh, uh, I think a lot of our audience is familiar with us uh, here. Uh, how do you come up with some of those unique flavors? Uh, every time I walk in there, it seems like there's just a whole smorgasbord of different taps with all kinds of things from maple, maple bacon porter to peanut butter and jelly, whatever. How do you come up with some of those? Uh, actual follow-up question here from Patricia is, do you have a dartboard? Or <laughs> where did that come from? A dartboard? Uh, and we have a beer coming out right now that is close to a dark lord it's our uh our russian imperial stout and um we're barrel aging it uh and it's going to be uh coming out in four packs and um we'll do different variations uh, uh we'll do just the straight russian imperial stout aged in the uh, high west uh barrels then we're going to be doing um uh vanilla uh, add vanilla to it and then uh, so maybe a, a coffee stout as well but um uh, for the unique flavors that we come into, that was one of uh, the things that really attracted me to Funky Buddha because I've, I've gone to many culinary-inspired breweries but um, I, uh, across the entire country, but uh, Funky Buddha does it really, really well. And um, uh, the head brewer and uh, one of the founders of the company, Ryan, uh, Ryan Sens, uh he's the mastermind with that. I don't know what he does in his office, but he's always coming up with um, these, these different concoctions to, to add for beer. Um, with uh, our beer, uh, No Crust, uh, which is like a peanut butter and jelly brown ale. I mean, he really captured the flavor of uh, peanut butter and jelly through it. And I, was, I was mesmerized how he knew how to do that. And uh, it's something that I picked up and, uh, and kind of learned from him. So it's, uh, yeah, it, uh, Ryan Sense, he's, he's the mastermind behind all that stuff. And uh, how, how about our friends over at Bonehook? Uh, where, uh, where do your recipes come from? So uh, recipes come from me um, on anything that, uh, there, there's a few things that were there that we've, we've held on to uh, when I, from before I started. But most of those things have been tweaked to, uh, to more, more to my liking or to be more efficient. Uh, but as far as uh, flavors and, and, and things like that, uh, a lot of it's just, um, you know, pick out your favorite thing. Uh, do you like pistachios? I've done a pistachio beer. Do you like, uh, you know, chocolate and banana? You know, I've done that. Um, so it, it's, it's, it really is a culinary base when you start getting into the flavors. And then from there, it's just it's a matter of figuring out how do I get those flavors into the beer? What kind of food product can I use? Because there are a lot of things that if you use in the use it in the beer, it affects the way the beer, uh, you know, will sustain. Uh, you know, if it will hold up for for very long, um, the head retention. Um, you know, a lot of people won't use bananas in beer uh, or natural coconut because the the oil in those products are um, 
you know, will affect the head the head uh, retention, and will and will it'll affect how well that beer holds up over time. So uh, a lot of that uh, you have to factor into how do I get that flavor into this into this product now? Um, you know, do we re-ferment it? Uh, do we you know because if you put sugar into beer, the yeast eventually is going to reactivate, and eat it, um, and then your if you if you bottle your bottles can explode. So do we kill the yeast or do we you know pasteurize it? You know, there's there's a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, thought process that has to go into, you know, how do I how do I get, you know this is what I want to do, but now how do I do it? Um, but yeah, it just look at your look at your in your refrigerator, look in your cabinet, and pick out some flavors and say, boy, that would really be good in a beer, and that's what a lot of us do. Great, excellent. Well, we're just about out of time for questions, but I do see one more question in the chat there from David saying, are we allowed to sample the beers yet or, uh, or were we supposed to do that already? Yeah, I was honestly hoping that you would be at least two or three deep by now. Otherwise, I would have had some more jokes prepared. Uh, but thank you all for Thanks to our friends at Bonehook and Funky Buddha for the great questions and uh, the great insights into that. We're going to move on to the next segment now. Uh, so thank you for having us. It's an honor to be here. Let's raise a with glass that, to our uh, generous take it away. who stepped up to support the museum tonight. And all of you who are participating are doing your part. The Science of Beer fundraiser is fortunate to have many generous sponsors. A special thanks to Wells Fargo as our presenting sponsor. And I'd like to thank our brewery partners, Funky Buddha and Bonehook Brewing, for taking us behind the scenes and providing the delicious samplings of beer you have in front of you tonight. Mods represents the spirit of South Florida by inspiring growth in a diverse community with ever-changing technologies. Our community only thrives when everyone has the ability to be connected to these experiences. Even during the pandemic, when the museum public hours were suspended, MODS quickly transitioned to virtual and outreach programming to continue to provide access for all. Now more than ever, our world relies on science and we rely on you. MODS continues to connect people to science through virtual and offsite programming and educational support for educators and students. Without public visitation, MODS relies on your assistance to run day-to-day -day operations and to keep these virtual platforms running. We have a few people who would like to share how much MODS has helped them during this unprecedented time. Our children have grown with MODS visiting our center in many ways as far as being very excited when visitors come to the school. They're also excited when Ms. Missy brings all type of different activities, animals, uh, steam projects, race cars, things of that nature. When they see the mod stem mobile pull up from the window because we're on the outskirt of the street, they're just, Miss Missy's here, Miss Missy's here. What does she have for us today? They're just so excited in the school. Like the whole school knows Miss Missy's there. Mod has connected our learners to STEM with them being more excited about science projects, science activities, and science experiments. They like when we are able to build volcanoes, hands-on projects as far as making ice with smoke, the excitement and feedback we receive from the parents and kids where it's the children always want Miss Missy at the center. They're very excited when she comes. They never want her to leave. They just so involved with each other when Miss Missy's there because they want to be excited for what she's actually bringing us. It's always something new every time. Our educators have learned to incorporate STEM more into their lesson planning throughout the week. Now every week we incorporate a different science or STEM activity into our lesson plans that will make the children be more aware of what to expect when Miss Missy is coming to the school. Well, the education support provided by the museum is invaluable. Everything that he has to do happens here um, because at this point in time, being having to go to work and then have knowing that he's not going to be in class virtually right now being at the museum helps him to get his education properly knowing that he's here at the museum knowing that it's very very clean knowing that social distancing is is something that happens on a 
regular basis that never changes. When he comes in, he gets his temperature taken. He still has to answer all of those questions every single day, which is really good. They take it very, very seriously. And when I came in for the tour, even um, just seeing how everyone was spaced out and how the program at the museum was, um, what they were going to be doing and how they were going to be doing it, I felt comfortable immediately. He is in aftercare here at the museum. Uh, he loves it. He's learning all sorts of things, things that I wish I could do. So seeing him come home with a smile on his face and I got to do this, I, I got to do that. I went to science camp. So for me, this is this is huge. What's going to happen when you have to go back to regular school? And he's like, I hope that doesn't have to happen. Uh, they do everything in a beautiful environment that makes him happy to come to school every day. Brady here, back in the hangar here at Mods. Uh, we've been learning a lot about brewing today and just the science of beer. So we are going to get into a little bit more about the chemistry uh, behind some of those aspects of brewing. Uh, first, I want to thank our sponsors at RV Retailers for this segment. Uh, we're going to be talking about a certain part of the beer. So when you have a beer, you want it to have a good flavor. You want it to have a good texture. You might want it to have a good rich color in there. You might even want it to have a nice catchy name or something like that too. But really the main kind of secret ingredient you need is that yeast that's gonna bring it to life. So we're gonna try to create that the best we can with uh, some of our materials from the chemistry lab. So we're going to start with some dish soap. Get a good heaping thing of dish soap in here. good. Just a little bit there at the bottom. Might even add just a little bit more food coloring to it just to make it pop. Next thing I'm going to add is hydrogen peroxide. But not quite like the hydrogen peroxide that is in your medicine cabinet. The hydrogen peroxide in your medicine cabinet is one or maybe three percent. Uh, this is 30 percent. So the one percent that you have in your uh, medicine cabinet is good for when you get a cut and you want to kill the bacteria away from the cut so that it doesn't get infected. This is over 10 times more corrosive than that. So exposing it to the skin might even just peel a little bit of the skin off. Let's just say hypothetically that's happened to me doing this before. Uh, so I'm going to put on safety goggles, I'm going to have gloves on, and I'm going to add mm, say about 50, 75 milliliters of the peroxide to my solution here. So now you can think of this as like the malt and the barley and the hops and stuff kind of mixing together, creating a whole little solution here. And we're gonna add that last little drop in that's gonna bring it to life, right? Like a Frankenstein or something. Really get this moving. So it's already foaming up a little bit just because of the soap. But that's not really the type of foam that we're looking for here. We're looking for a type of foam that's gonna make me clear things off of this table so that I don't make too big of a corrosive mess. The last thing I'm gonna add is this potassium iodide solution. That's gonna act as our yeast substitute. It's a bit more powerful. So I'm gonna add this in and we're gonna see uh, how these ingredients kind of come to life in here. So now we can see it starting to foam up starting to rise. And remember, we just started with like this little layer at the bottom of the soap. And now it's kind of coming up all the way out the top. And you can kind of see this swirling of colors too. Remember, I started with blue dish soap and I put blue food coloring in it, but now it's turning green. That's because of the oxidation happening. Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, right? Instead of like two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom in water, it's two and two. And the potassium iodide 
is helping to break one of those O's off of there. So we have some oxygenation happening. We have some water vapor being released. So this is actually, there's some hot air coming off of this. If you're around this, you can't really see it from the camera, but I can feel it. Uh, there's a temperature release happening here that's pretty hot. You can see a little bit of the blue kind of still swirling in here. So this is a bit of foam here. This is maybe a bit too much foam for a beer for my liking. Uh, I don't know what you're into. This is kind of like a level of foam that like you shook up a can or something or you rode a bike or something or skateboarded with a, with a, a six pack or something. So that's a bit too much. But you do want like a layer of the foam at the top just to kind of keep that, that flow, keep that life in the beer. But this might be a little bit excessive. But this is our uh, elephant toothpaste. You can see it's still kind of coming up. And remember, we just started with that one little layer of liquid there at the bottom. So as we learned from our friends at Funky Buddha, uh, there's a lot going into brewing science. What's the most responsible or what's the most kind of interesting way uh, we can make use of our cans after we've emptied them? So first we're gonna start, if you do wanna just recycle your cans, right, to make the most room in your recycling bin, you want the cans to be crushed. So whether you crush them with your hand or your shoe or you have one of those uh, like lever things, uh, that's all well and fine, but you can also crush your can using the power of chemistry. So on this hot plate, I have a couple of empty cans and they're getting pretty hot. I have just a little layer of water at the bottom uh, and all that's really doing once they're on the hot plate is kind of getting some hot air circulating in the can. So I want the air in the cans to be really hot and I'm going to flip them over into this uh, tray of ice cold water. And when the hot air from the cans meets the really cold temperature from the water, that disparity in temperature should be uh, a big enough difference in pressure where the high pressure outside the can and the low pressure inside the, uh, inside the can trying to escape creates a vacuum and the high pressure outside the can crushes it just using the power of chemistry and differences in pressure uh, instigated by temperature. So we're gonna let this get just a little bit hotter than this. So now we're gonna try to crush these cans just with the power of chemistry, just with the power of air pressure and temperature differences. So just right from that, just that difference in temperature hot, hot air inside the can and the cold, cold water. Once that meets, it creates a vacuum. The hot air tries to leave, but the heavy air presses down on it. And now I have a crush can. Now I have enough room in my recycling bin for a lot more of them. But now let's see, uh, we're gonna bring out LAN to maybe see if there's something a bit more interesting if you wanna take that recycling into your own hands and do something with your ca empty can. So now we're gonna learn what we can do with our cans that we wanna recycle them ourselves and kind of take matters into our own hands. Uh, you may have received a bag, a little kit with some random materials in them. You might be wondering, what is some of this stuff for? Some of it is like a battery pack, there's like some pipe cleaner, some of it looks like it's useful, some of it looks like, uh, what are we gonna do with these things? And maybe by now you have an empty beer can or two. So Lan's gonna show us what we can do with all those things, Lan. So um, just like you guys received your little brown bag at home, we're gonna just go through it really quick to see what's inside. We have some nice sticks. These are gonna keep our back all nice and sturdy for our robot. We have some nice pipe cleaner here. You guys see there, you can intertwine those, make them nice colors. We have two nice wheels. Depending upon which bag you got, you either got nice big wheels or maybe some nice small wheels. They all work, all wheel drive. <laughs> And also a nice battery pack and two batteries. My second battery here. And also you will receive a nice bottle cap and a glue. So um, it looks like a hot glue for your hot glue gun, but it'll go on the back of your robot. So we're gonna first take our can. And if just, just before we go any further, if you have any other extra materials in your house, you wanna dress up your robot to make it look at all nice, I spray painted this one, I got really down and dirty with this one. So we're gonna get our tape. And don't forget you have your motor in your bag as well to go with your wheels to get your wheels a turning. Now, the first thing that I did with my different robots that I made here 
was Brady. I taped my motor to the top of my bottle cap. As you guys can see in here, I have a bottle cap. Um, on this one, I have cotton swabs and a bottle cap at the bottom to have my motor inside of it. And on this one, I taped my motor, my motor to my bottle cap and it gave me an extension. So the bottle cap will help you guys and will help you as well, Brady. So, so we're making our beer cans into robots that yes. are gonna move around. They're gonna move around and if you wanna get creative and give it arms with your pipe cleaner, you can. Okay, all right, so, <laughs> so first step is attaching the wheels to the motor. Yes, Okay. like so. Oh, wait, a little tension and I got it. Just remember inside of your bag, just like the viewers at home, you guys have a little colorful tape. It might have some nice little prints on it like this, but if you have your own duct tape or electrical tape, you guys can use it as well. I have some electrical tape. I'll be taping my motor to my can. I'd say go ahead and feel free, like if you have any extra things at home that you want to add to this. Extra, like I put eyes on this guy with other wheels from a different Hot Wheels set. It's awesome. Yeah, I so said there's, there's, there's no rules here we want to have. I want you to take uh, your full creative license with your beer can robot. And now I take my stick. I can, because I have a shorter can, you guys might have taller cans. <laughs> Gonna put my glue stick on it. Just take this glue stick. It's not coming out. Oh, these glues, yeah, these are like the filaments of like a super glue thing. Okay, so we're using those as a, as like a balancing thing here. Yes. Okay, yeah, so there's a, we're just trying to, one thing we like to do in the hangar is uh, make use out of things that they weren't really made for. So like, this is a good opportunity for these. We found that the filament of a uh, hot glue gun is actually a good balance for our beer can robot. So making use of things that they weren't intended for is kind of the name of the game in making. As you guys can see here. And now I take my battery pack and I put it on. So we should take some more tape here. It's looking a little bit more like a robot than just a beer can. So I'd say we're, we're on the way there. Also like the showroom you have here, I said it with the with different models. Yes, I do. I have a luxury model. I have <laughs> this is more like a utility <laughs> utility vehicle. This is like you know our our our, our sport beer can robot. <laughs> Take a cruise down the strip. Taping them on, and as he's taping them on, we want to make sure that it's balanced enough to go. That's why yes. we're leaning these out. We kind of get these uh, bat shapes to it, kind of the like side. the the R two D two thing. Yes. I gave it some R2-D2 colors, if you guys can see here, along with our museum colors. So you're just gonna make sure you put red on red and black on black. Once we get the motor all put together, everything's all nice and taped. We got our arms on, we got all of our accessories on, all of our creative juices flowed on here. Just gonna put it on and watch it go. Oh, we hit a roadblock. There's always bumps in the road. You got to manually stop these things. So be careful of uh, where you're sending them out. Uh, your cat might get a little freaked out. Maybe that's okay. Uh, so Lan, thank you for showing us all the neat things we can do, all the ways that we can recycle our beer cans ourselves with the materials we got. And uh, excited to see what you guys can come up with. Thank you so much, everyone. I really hope you're enjoying tonight. I want to remind everyone to text Science of Beer to 243725. Again, please text Science of Beer to 243725. I just want to say thank you. As president and CEO of the Museum of Discovery and Science, tonight took a lot of work to put together. I want to thank all of our staff. I want to thank um, the entire team who put this together tonight. But above all, I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank our sponsors led by Wells Fargo. And we're going to hear from Eric Strati, Senior Vice President, South Florida Market Executive with Wells in a minute. Tonight, thanks to our sponsors, thanks to all of you at home, we were able to raise almost $100,000 for the museum's COVID relief fund. That's a huge help 
to ensure that the museum continues connecting people to inspiring science. Thank you, we're thrilled that you were here tonight. I'm incredibly grateful to our beer sponsors. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Eric. So cheers to all of you, thank you. Hey, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Brady, and the entire mod team for a fun-filled evening. I never knew there was so much science that went into beer making. Thank you, everyone, for showing your support for mods by joining us tonight. For more than 40 years, MODS has been here for our community, providing learners of all ages with inspiring STEM experiences. From outer space to ocean deep, MODS makes science come alive in magical ways, as we saw tonight. Wells Fargo is incredibly proud of our partnership with MODS, which dates back to the early years of the museum's history. There are many reasons we partner with MODS, with one of the most important being our shared commitment to access and opportunity. Nationwide, Wells Fargo works with nonprofit organizations like MODS to address issues facing society, including diversity and inclusion, environmental sustainability, financial health, small business growth, economic empowerment, and housing affordability. Our commitment and support remain steadfast during these challenging times. We are honored to support MODS along with all of you. Thank you for attending tonight. And please remember to place your bids in the silent auction as it will be closing at 9 p.m. Tonight, cheers to all of you.